for those that um you know really want to have that real-time experience where you're having a conversation with ai and doing all of those different stages like converting your speech to text that text goes to an llm that llm comes back out uh as speech you know you want to reduce the bottlenecks as much as possible and so that's where we're seeing a lot of value being added for the community hey it's Simon with ip exchange uh coming at you with another ip experience this time with mark heaps from grok so grok has uh, been making some waves in the ai space because they do ai a little differently to how you'd usually expect on for a cpu or a gpu so uh mark uh shall we start with what is an lpu yeah, absolutely, and thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. I uh, appreciate the the opportunity. So, yeah, we've we've had a bit of a virality moment. People have started learning, you know, who Grok is. We've actually been around uh, since 2016, mm -hmm. but uh, like others have said, we've had an eight year overnight success, and um, it's been really really exciting. So the the developers that have been building on Grok uh, have been asking this same question: Why are you guys so much faster? What makes it different, et cetera? And um, the LPU is really the secret sauce, um, you know, at the center of why we're different. So one of the things that our founder knew when they started the company, you know, all those years ago was that um, GPUs, which is what everybody really uses in, in traditional AI compute, um, you know, whether that's NVIDIA or AMD, um, we recognize that although they're spectacular at training models, there was a ceiling for them when it came to low latency. And we started mm -hmm. reading some of their papers and we started learning that um, about every eight GPUs, you would see it start leveling off in its ability to maintain linear scale okay. for low latency. So the bigger the system you make, the slower in essence it's going to get relative to that ratio. Okay. And so we invented an entirely new category of processor that we call the LPU as a category. The chip mm -hmm. itself is called Grok chip. Okay. And uh, yeah, Simple. it's really designed to be exceptional at what is at the heart of AI models. Mm -hmm. So um, just for our audience, so I understand the LPU is language processing unit. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Okay. That's correct. And, and really what makes the, the LPU so special is it's exceptional at anything that's sort of linear algebra or linear sequential processing. Um, we've got lots of videos online that show the difference mm -hmm. between how data moves on a GPU versus an LPU. But, it, you know, at the at the core of a lot of these LLMs and other um, transformer based models mm -hmm. is a linear structure. And so if you just think about this in regards to language, uh, you wouldn't want to generate the hundredth word in a phrase until you've generated the 99th word because the context yeah. matters in that sequence. And so we called it a language processing unit because so much is really emblematic of language, whether that is a chat bot, uh, conversational AI technologies, or something that I know you and I are both deeply passionate about, which is music. So yes. audio <laughs> is something that is also very linear, right? You, yeah. you, you run in a linear sequence for audio to make sense. So these are all the sorts of things that the developer community are discovering we provide a much faster speed and performance at. And if you're using AI for something that's, you know, not dependent on ultra low latency or real time, mm -hmm. then, you know, you're probably okay with a, a smaller um, form factor of, of system, you know, maybe one or two GPUs, kind of like edge mm -hmm. devices, which I know a lot of your audience yes. uh, actually work with. But for those that, um, you know, really want to have that real time experience where you're having a conversation with AI and doing all of those different stages, like converting your speech to text, that text goes to an LLM, that LLM comes back out uh, as speech, you know, you want to reduce the bottlenecks as much as possible. And so that's where we're seeing a lot of value being added for the community. Cool. So um, this, uh, to be fully transparent with the audience, this is not the first time Mark and I have talked. We had a preliminary nope. chat and then we had a rehearsal of this, which uh, <laughs> unfortunately went completely awry due to bad connection. But um, uh, in the first time we talked, uh, Mark kind of illustrated how the LPU kind of takes over from the GPU at a certain point uh, when it comes to scaling. So if you imagine this is the curve for the performance of the GPU, then mm -hmm. uh, as with more GPUs on this axis and... Um, 
a kind of performance on this axis, mm -hmm. then it's your LPUs intersect it at kind of this point, and then that's where GPUs aren't quite as good because there's too many of them and they're not getting any faster and the LPUs right. scale linearly. So what, whereabouts is that um, intersection point? Well, you know, it, it really depends on the workload and the model, but what mm. we've seen in the, the previous papers that have been published is that about every eight GPUs, you okay. see a slight notch down in low latency. Mm. And then once you start getting up to the hundreds of GPUs, you'll see that it it starts to asymptote and, and really flatten out yeah. on the on the curve, right? Um, we've been awarded two ISCA papers. They're available on our website for people that really want to dive into the, mm -hmm. the semiconductor side of it. Um, but this first generation of our chip, you can actually scale up to thousands of LPUs mm -hmm. and maintain linear scale of performance with that low latency. So, you know, not only are we faster, but our ceiling doesn't hit until much, much later in the stack. So you can imagine building these massive token factories or data centers with LPUs and not needing to sacrifice that performance. Now, what's really exciting for us is we have a next gen of silicon that's going to be mm -hmm. coming out next year. We've already publicly announced that it's being fabricated by Samsung here in Taylor, Texas, uh, just up the road from me. Okay, and cool. so our supply chain is still going to be North America based. That chip design is going to be another 10x leap for us. And that chip will actually scale to hundreds of thousands of LPUs without losing any of that linear performance. So I think we're really just seeing a scratch of the surface of what level of compute um, that AI will take advantage of. And of course, that will unleash all sorts of potential applications in AI. So in, in terms of those applications, uh, where do you see is kind of the perfect spot where the LPUs really shine better than anything else? You know, I, I've been saying this for a while, even before I was involved with Grok. I used to work at Google and, and I had some mm. AI projects there and, and I've worked at other spots. Um, I personally believe that the future is going to be an ubiquity of digital assistants. And, you know, I, I okay. reckon this kind of like Star Wars. If you remember, you know, Luke Skywalker has mm. R2-D2, which is great yeah. at all of the hacking and breaking into buildings and the Death Star. But then he needed C-3PO to be a language bot and be able yeah. to translate all these languages. But, you know, neither of them were very good at moving around. They weren't like a battle droid. Mm. I think we're rapidly racing to a future where you're going to have all of this multimodality where different types of models, just like droids in the movie, mm. do different functions and services. To connect all those together, you're now scaling these like agent to agent level services, right? Because of that, you don't want each stage or each bot or service that you connect with to be throttled or have this high latency ceiling. So okay. where we're going to be advantaged is as the applications build out more, like conversational AI, like multimodality, like agent to agent, um, the speed that we can provide com compute at at each stage of the chain is going to have so much margin that those entire end-to-end -end workflows are going to be advantaged by the LPU. Okay, so in terms of uh, like digital assistants, say if you had, a, I don't know, a website with a customer service thing where you really want a proper, proper LLM that can understand what you're doing and isn't just a, right. a decision tree that uh, ends up with you having to call a, call a helpline. Um, mm -hmm. would, would that be implemented on kind of one Grok stack per, um, per conversation or would you kind of have multiple conversations per stack because it's still pretty fast and it can just go between them. Yeah, yeah. So the, the right way to think about this, I was, I was telling someone the other day is, um, you know, imagine you had a delivery service and that delivery service, you're using a basic car mm. to deliver packages to people, okay. right? And you know that car, you know, maybe it tops out at, at running some speed, you know, 60 miles an hour or something yeah. like that. What Grok is, is more like that lorry, right? That big box okay. truck. But it turns out that our box truck can be driven 10 times faster than that car. Now, the okay. challenge is you want to start by filling the box truck. Mm. So if you're running lots of small packets and you're running, you know, really sort of low volume, those cars are perfect for your business. Mm. But if you said, hey, I want to be able to get packages to my customers 10 times faster. Well, the one requirement is you need to fill the box truck, right? Mm. Otherwise, it doesn't economically make yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. But for most businesses today, the demand for AI isn't really a, a small thing. Mm. They can fill the truck very, very fast. So you can run lots of conversations on the stack. And a good example okay, of this, cool. You know, we yeah. we made um, 
Grok chat, which is available on our website. Mm -hmm. It's just grok.com. Uh, when we sort of had this virality moment and we were all excited at work going, Oh, we, we, we've had a hundred thousand requests. What a brilliant day. Um, we're now averaging nearly a million requests a day. And so okay. as of yesterday, we were at, I think 56 million requests to the system okay. and that's, you know, multiple racks, but these are millions of calls that are hitting the system at the same time. So mm -hmm. that's really, you know, wonderful to see in the way that the queuing works and the way that we have that throughput. It's interesting you mentioned call centers. We actually do mm -hmm. have a customer and they've been around for about 20 years. They're one of mm -hmm. the experts that provide previously call center technologies to companies like T-Mobile and Verizon okay. and yeah. others, right? And you call in, hey, I want to cancel my service. You talk to a human. Well, what they do as a product is they had a um, technology that would listen to the conversation and would give feedback to the human operator and say, oh, they said cancel. You should offer them these things as a suggestion. Ah, uh, Okay. Now, the problem that they had, and they've had for a long time, and they were running it on, on a GPU-based uh, mm -hmm. system, was that every time the human would say something and you would have speech to text to input that and then give the operator feedback, it was taking them on average 20 plus seconds to get a suggestion from the Ooh, technology. Okay, yeah, that's a problem. So, so now that's become a training tool, not a real-time assistant, mm -hmm. right? The operator would review the advice after the call and say, okay, what should I have done better? Now they're running on Grok. And they're getting real-time feedback from the actual LLM. In that case, I believe they're running Llama. Okay. And um, with that, they're actually seeing a massive spike in, in retaining customers because of the advice the LLM is giving the human operator. So that's a great example that you brought up and where, where that real-time inference uh, matters. Cool. Um, so I guess a question that we all always want to ask on these is how does a design engineer evaluate this technology, but I suppose it sounds like you need to evaluate this on mass. So do you have a way of doing that? Actually, yeah, it's, it's one of the things I'm glad you asked too, because we, we, we need to keep clarifying this for people. So we have what we call uh, a, a, a ramp to deployment mm -hmm. optionality. So today, if you're a developer and you're building using an LLM or a similar model, for example, and we have a, we have a model library, um, in fact, we have a speech to text model that's going to launch in the next 24 hours. Oh, and, nice. Um, Convenient. Yeah, yeah. I actually haven't told anybody that yet. So uh, what developers can do today is they can go to grok.com. You'll see a link on there that says grok cloud. And this mm -hmm. takes you into a console developer playground environment. And there you can go and actually start building out your application, just like you would in some of the other providers like OpenAI. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, if you've already built for OpenAI, it's like a three-click process oh, to convert, convert your model over and just generate an API key. And then you can do your calls with your application to Grok. Um, there's a free tier for that. So we've got right now over 125,000 developers signed up in the last eight weeks. Cool. And there's, there's currently nearly 30,000 applications already running on Grok in just eight weeks. And so it's been very exciting because it means we can allow everybody to develop their application and test their concepts. And that's one of our core principles, right? We want AI for all and mm. everybody says it in their marketing, but we literally stood it up and said, here it is, you have access to it, it's mm. free, just use it. And then we have enterprise tiers beyond that. So a lot of the, the customers we have, have said, hey, we're just gonna start building on it. Um, and going from there. Now, you do eventually reach a fork in the road where someone says, okay, we're just a cloud service and, and that's fine for my application. Mm. Then you have some of these institutions that are either the government or you've got you know financial institutions where they have to meet certain compliance requirements for security. And in those environments on the ramp, we have co-hosting that we can do in a data center environment where the hardware is dedicated to those people, mm. or they just buy hardware to be on-prem you know, for their particular operation. And that's, that's an enterprise scale solution. Okay. So I guess for them, they, they can test it on kind of an isolated server, totally. that, I guess, I guess with like fake bank details. For that's example. right. Yeah. Synthetic data. That's right. Yeah. Just see, see how it works. And then they can kind of build their own data center based on the Grok chip. That's exactly right. That's cool. exactly okay. right. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we know is exciting for us is the, the GPU we know has a ceiling on low latency, mm. whether you're talking about the A100, the H100, or even the new Blackwell that was recently announced. What's, what's traditional or I guess historical uh, in technology is we can solve how to make technology smaller, faster, less energy usage, et cetera, right? 
but architecturally the GPU has a ceiling on low latency. Mm. And so we know that for example, with our V2 silicon that'll be coming out next year, mm. we're going from a 14 nanometer die to a four nanometer die. Okay. And so we're, we're, we're outperforming the latest and greatest incumbents today on 10 year old silicon methodologies. Okay, cool. So as they're potentially going to get close to catching up to us, we haven't seen it yet, but they might, we have this whole other level of silicon that's about to be released. And I know your audience is very into the edge. That's mm. one of those things that we sort of jettisoned as a market for us with the V1 silicon. Yeah. But when we look at V2 going to such a smaller chiplet size and such a lower power usage, suddenly that market opens up again to say, well, what would this look like when you take advantage of mobile cellular connection technologies as they get faster networks and lower power footprint that we can put on a device? It's going to be a really exciting time. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a scale down in terms of uh, yeah. the nano scale. So yeah, that's going to be very exciting to see what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess uh, one other question just out of curiosity is because so many of our, um, our engineers are going to be working with hardware like uh, like on the on that edge level mm -hmm. at the moment if they were wanted to work with grok would it be a case of they they'd connect their hardware to the the grok servers and like do kind of cloud edge computing um, That's exactly in that right. way okay That's cool. exactly right yeah yeah if someone was working on an edge device today and we have a number of companies that are doing that mm. uh, they're basically a cloud edge kind of hybrid service, right? Where okay. um, they're connecting to Grok Cloud, they're calling one of the open source models, you know, through that API key. They've got local hardware. We've we've even seen one customer uh, developer, they're using Raspberry Pis. Okay, and they've nice. created all these devices that as long as it can call to the internet, okay. you could take advantage of that Grok speed. And so that's that's really exciting to see what some of the folks are doing with robotics and computer vision mm -hmm. models and, and more. Um, we've got a number of robotic arms companies that are that are doing some okay. really neat, interesting things at the edge. Cool. Well, I think when the V2 silicon comes out, we're going to have to have a catch up and see what happened, what what, yeah. what people start to use that for, because that's that's going to be very exciting. But um, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us, and I'm so glad that the internet held out this time. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. If you have, if you could summarize, like in three sentences, what you think are the key. Um, the key people who you'd want to come and see Grok and why for their application, what would you say? You know, we're, we're really about championing the, the developer community. So if you're a developer, you're excited to take advantage of open source models and you want to see what that can look like running at 10x speed, I would say come to grok.com and jump on the console. And for those of you that are maybe more hardware specific. We've got some great papers on our website where you can learn more about the silicon and the, the advantages of our hardware because there's more than the chip. We've invented all kinds of things for network topology and more. Yeah. So just come check it all out. Cool. Um, well, I think that's been an absolutely amazing introduction to Grok. And I, um, do you have any idea when the V2 silicon is actually going to come out? We're, uh, we're hoping to start getting our tests in lab around January. And then okay. so it'll be sometime in 2025. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll definitely catch up then, if not before. And Absolutely. yeah, thank you. This has uh, been a great chat. And uh, I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed it. Come to Grok if you want the fastest language processing AI out there. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks so much, Eamon. Thanks to the IP audience. Hey, where my engineers at?